Good evening. My name is Ellen Dunham Jones. I'm the a professor in the School of Architecture and director of the MS in Urban Design degree here at Georgia Tech. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 2023 TSW lecture. TSW is an award-winning firm that integrates its strengths in architecture, landscape architecture, and planning into much beloved mixed use communities centered on vibrant public spaces. Now, dear, such as these shown here. Uh, dear to my heart, often their work involves reviving and retrofitting aging suburban downtowns, as well as uh, planning brand new communities and buildings. In all cases, I am particularly admire how they have been transforming policies such as form-based codes, something we'll hear about more tonight, and transfer of development rights that are leading change. Uh, to celebrate its 30th anniversary three years ago, TSW chose to fund an annual urban design lecture in our lecture series here in the School of Architecture. T, S, and W, thank you very much. The four other partners, thank you very much, and the 30 some employees. We are extremely grateful to you for your inspirational work and your generous community building forward looking gift and the way it helps us all learn more, aspire more, and share more. Now, before I introduce tonight's lecturer, Dan Parolek, I want to invite you all. All of you, everybody here, I invite you right now, pull out your phones and go tap Google and go to slido.com and enter the code 3534262. This is where I'm hoping that you will post questions throughout the lecture and like each other's questions. We're not simulcasting tonight, but we are recording this lecture. And at the end of Dan's talk, I will moderate Q&A based on the questions in Slido so that we can hear them in the recording. So once again, the code is 35-34-262 at slido.com. So while you're doing that, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the further talks that are coming up for the rest of the semester. Next Wednesday at five o'clock, Pam Sessions, of Hedgewood Homes will be speaking in one of the real estate development talks in the Cadell building. And then at six o'clock, we're sort of doing a little cross-pollination with the real estate uh, talk and an exhibition opening reception for our entries this year into the ULI Heinz competition. So at six o'clock is the, the reception and that will be held on the bridge. So please, please come to the reception and uh, cheer on our teams. The following week, March 8th, is the Douglas C. Allen lecture. And we're very excited about having Dilip Dakuna come. Uh, he is an amazing architect, landscape architect, uh, really exploring how do we live on land that is increasingly wet. So all of the areas, especially in Southeast Asia, um, flooding. And so the uh, ocean of wetness is this platform that he is going to be talking about. And then that same week on Friday, during our open house for new uh, incoming students at three o'clock, we will have another in the Atlanta talk series. And this one will focus on reimagining suburban neighborhood infrastructure and I will be presenting uh, some of my retrofitting suburbia work, but really I'm re I will be presenting the student work um, of the students who have been retrofitting. Uh, and Commissioner Ted Terry of DeKalb County will talk also a little bit about how that student work has impacted him and DeKalb County. Um, and Kai Uwe Bergman from Big and Ingeborg Rocker will join us in discussion for that one. Then March 15th, we get another Atlanta Talks, this one on redesigning for a circular economy. Uh, the location of that one is still to be determined, but lots of folks 
uh, coming to have a really broad-based, very multidisciplinary discussion. And in particular, focusing on in Atlanta, how we are already uh, making use of uh, and implementing circular economy issues. Then on the 29th, we get another, the last of the Atlanta talks, reimagining building scale infrastructure and featuring the work of our beloved Brian Bell and David Yoakum um, with their buildings. And I see David Yoakum got left out. Terribly sorry about that. April 5, uh, the, the EQUA forum and more details will be forthcoming. So again, go to slido.com. Hopefully everybody's already gotten in there and uh, 35342622. All right. So tonight gives me great pleasure to introduce Dan Parolek. I've known him for several years, mostly through the Congress for the New Urbanism, and it's been delightful to watch how he and his wife and partner have consistently innovated community design, both with inventive building types and nuanced coding and planning. Dan is an urban designer, architect, author, and the founding principal of OptiCoast Design based in Berkeley, California. The firm is focused on equitable urban placemaking, innovative housing design and policy, and zoning reform for walkable urbanism. The work has been featured broadly, including in the New York Times, Next City, Fast Company, Wall Street Journal, the list goes on and on. He's particularly known for championing the missing middle housing movement and wrote the book shown here in the middle that we will also have a book signing and sales um, at the end of the lecture. As a thought leader in zoning reform efforts to remove barriers to walkable urbanism, Dan also co-authored form, the form, the form-based codes book, which was named one of Plan Edison's best books in 2009. He works with public and private sector clients and integrates scales from the master plan, building type design, and individual architectural buildings. I'm particularly intrigued by his work on the soon to be completed cul-de-sac Tempe, a radical example of car-free urbanism, or which he prefers to refer to as transit rich or mobility rich, mobility rich uh, urbanism. But it's amazing to, I, to me just how many rules you can break once you don't have to accommodate parking. He has completed numerous missing middle neighborhoods, citywide form-based codes, and sustainable growth strategies for diverse communities from California to our Africa. Please join me in welcoming Dan Parolek. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, tonight. And um, as Ellen mentioned, uh, with my background in architecture uh, and urban design and also um, communication design, uh, when I come to an audience where I know there'll be a lot of students, I actually like to frame the conversation in a way that um, I, I talk about how my education, my travel, my professional experience um, utilizes design thinking uh, to provide very creative uh, and innovative solutions um, for both cities, counties, public sector uh, clients that we work with, as well as developers that we work with as well. And um, I was realizing that I was last here in Atlanta about six years ago. Um, the Georgia Conservancy, I don't know if I can't imagine Catherine Moore had me out. Uh, she became a champion of the missing middle housing conversation. And I got a chance to go out and just as every other city, uh, any neighborhood in Atlanta that was built prior to the 1940s has this amazing mix of these missing middle typologies. Um, and at some point in our uh, planning history, our development history, our zoning history, uh, we put in so many barriers in place for the delivery of these housing choices um, that uh, I mean, there's there's a there's a period of five or six decades where almost every city delivered almost, you know, maybe five percent of their new housing was missing middle housing. And so, right, regions, especially rapidly growing regions like the Atlanta Metro, 
are having this really extreme affordable or attainable housing crisis. And I would say that I was pretty shocked. I, I travel all around the country to do work and to have these missing middle conversations, but your market, I can't believe how much has been built here and how much your costs of housing have increased so dramatically in six years. And it's just a little bit of a, like I like to say, I feel like you have about six years to respond to this housing crisis. And if this, the region doesn't respond to it, the window is going to close and the opportunity will be missed. And it'll be much like in the Bay Area where I'm from, where businesses are struggling to retain employees, attract employees as businesses because people can't afford to live in the region. Um, and uh, as Ellen mentioned, I uh, founded OptiCoast Design. It's been now 22 years ago. Uh, this will be interesting tidbit for the, the students and the graduate students in particular. So um, when I was graduating from the Master of Urban Design program at UC Berkeley, um, I wanted a job where I could work both at the building scale as well as like the city and the regional scale. And I wanted to be able to do architecture as well as planning, zoning reform. There wasn't a single firm in the entire Bay Area that had a position where you could actually do all of that. You sort of very sort of specific studios that you had to commit to. So I was like, well, I'll start my own practice. And I remember one of my former bosses saying, you can't just start your own practice. And it, it worked out, it's worked out pretty well. So 22 years later, uh, we're a founding B Corporation, 2007. We became B Corp certified, one of the initial uh, founding members, which means we're committed to a triple bottom line of uh, fiscal environmental and social responsibility. And I'll say that every single decision we make as a business, ranging from the types of projects and clients we work with to uh, transparency in our business decision-making, and um, even just like who we buy our office supplies from, like actually are informed by, by that commitment to this triple bottom line. And one of the highlights of my career is when we became a California Benefit Corporation on January 1st, the, the, the First day it was actually allowed, Yvonne Chenard from Patagonia was, was right next to us at the counter signing Patagonia's benefit corporation papers, and he actually went out to lunch with us. So um, it's a very great tight-knit community, and we are super fortunate uh, in our company that we can be super selective about the projects that we work on, and we want projects that, number one, are either going to define a model that can be replicated by others in a region, like a much needed model. Uh, we, we pick projects that really um, uh, can establish a new best practice standard, like what should our zoning actually be doing or what should our comprehensive plan be saying? And how do we create a comprehensive plan that actually gets implemented the day after it sort of gets adopted? And the third thing is just um, challenge the status quo. It's really easy as a planning and urban design practice to just go through the motions and like check all the boxes and deliver a document that isn't actually going to be that effective. And so we like to step up and say, we think you should do this, even this isn't the easiest thing for the city uh, to do. Um, you need to step outside of their comfort zone to actually do an effective plan and effective zoning code, effective long-term vision uh, for their community. And so, um, you know, one of the most impactful concepts that we have come up with is this idea of the missing middle housing. And in 2011, I wrote a, a, an article for the Smart Growth Network. It was a call for papers on ideas that planners need to know about. <laughs> and I, we introduced the first version of the missing middle diagram, which now seems to show up pretty much 90% of the planning documents that we see, which is super exciting. And in 2016, uh, there was so much interest in this idea that we launched a free online resource at missingmiddlehousing.com. I know a bunch of the students were using this the last time I spoke with them, which is really exciting. And then in 2020, I finally carved out enough space to sit down and document my thoughts and actually my book, uh, Missing Middle Housing, uh, Thinking Big and Building Small to Respond to the Housing Crisis was um, released. And what's great about this is that, um, even you know, 10 plus years later, after sort of planting these seeds, I think the, the need for this is, is even bigger. The need to understand it, the need to utilize it in our planning and our zoning reform, our discussions, discussions about um, equity and social justice. So um, 
really exciting. I think, why is this such an important topic? I think you all, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. A lot of my presentations really build up the, the story of this, but I just want to, I just want to reinforce that there's kind of a perfect storm right now of demographic shifts, um, a rapidly aging population, um, and uh, Right, this this idea that even like thirty percent of our households are one person, and do you think that we're planning, and zoning, and developing homes designed specifically to that single person household? No. The other thing is obviously we have a growing affordability crisis. I think this um, the last statistic was that thirty three percent of households who own a home are cost housing cost burdened, which means they're spending more than. 30% of their, their income on housing. And if you go to renters, it's higher than 50%. And that was data from almost a couple of years ago. So I'd imagine that probably has increased and that sort of housing instability has become a really big problem in every single corner of the country. I grew up in a small town in Nebraska, 20,000 population at the point at which they started having conversations about the need for affordable housing. I'm like, wow, this is like, every single corner of the country is in need of more housing and more housing choices and attainable housing choices. And we recently created this diagram that I just, this is only the second time I've actually ever presented this, is what we're finding in our work, especially with our public sector clients, is that it's really easy to open the floodgates with your zoning to make projects feasible for developers. But it's much harder and you need a much more nuanced approach to make sure that they're not only feasible, but they're delivering attainably priced housing. And those, the, and so that's a really important, and obviously this isn't just about a space for people to live in, but it's actually a high quality place. So we think about livability in terms of the housing as well. And so that, that missing middle sweet spot is a really important way for us to assess a lot of the missing middle work we're doing um, that I'm gonna walk you through here um, in a little bit. So, the first um, case study that I want to go through is sort of guiding the change in the single family home industry uh, with missing middle housing. And we historically did not work with a lot of production home builders. We tried it. They, you know, they just wouldn't innovate enough for us to be interested. But we found a client in Salt Lake City, uh, Holmes Homes, uh, one of the largest builders in the Salt Lake City region. They said, Spencer Holmes, it was a family-owned business. He said, I have two questions for you. Number one, our business has been founded, was founded on the delivery of large suburban homes, you know, many decades ago. Can missing middle housing help us evolve our business model? And number two was, well, we, we've tried a few things and we started building the three-story tuck under townhouses but we still can't deliver them at a price point that an entry-level buyer can afford. So can some creative thinking and missing middle typologies enable us to deliver housing at a price point lower than those townhouses? And so our answer was initially, yes, we think so. And ultimately we're actually able to work with them to develop these Muse housing project. Um, in, it's in the large daybreak master plan community in Salt Lake City. Um, and, what was interesting about this from a design perspective and this concept of design thinking is it, it took a site constraint. Our client purchased these two blocks and the lots were too deep to just have one building fronting onto the street, but they weren't quite deep enough for a really nice courtyard housing type or a cottage court. And so what we did is we took these blocks. So you have the streets around the perimeter, which have buildings fronting onto them. But then we split these blocks into four micro scale blocks, more pedestrian scale, and introduce this pedestrian muse that cuts through completely east, west, and north, south through the side and connects to a school across the street. We basically took a townhouse, flipped it on its side, so the building's 26 foot deep, and it has a really amazing spaces because it has natural light, on the long side, as opposed to that narrow side that you usually get in a historic townhouse where there's a really dark spot right in the middle. And we were able to deliver two-story volumes um, and this really great public realm 
Um, and the prices started at $185,000 and went up to about 220. Now those have gone up a bit in the last three to four years, but the, the, what's important is they were able to build and sell these at $35,000 less than that tuck under townhouse typology that you see being built all over your region right now, right? That's the easiest solution. And so um, what this demonstrates is that, and, and we really challenge ourselves that good design does not need to be expensive and attainable housing does not need to look unattractive, right? And so this was a hugely successful model in delivering this. It was published in Professional Builder Magazine, it won some awards. And what's really interesting about this is this, that was a for sale example of this muse type. We've actually now used it in for rent projects and they've performed super well as for rent housing types as well. Um, this is the highest performing um, housing type in a project in Omaha that I'm gonna walk you through in just a, Omaha, Nebraska, just a little bit. So super interesting. And I feel that it's a way better alternative than this for a lot of different reasons that we can talk about. And I'm assuming like every region is being inundated by these because they're super efficient and they're hard to compete with from a yield standpoint, especially if you're wanting to sell fee simple housing types. So we need to get beyond this. And that's one of the challenges and really incentivize a better housing type in your zoning and your planning. I think that's a big part of it. Okay, so the project that, that Ellen uh, was really excited to talk about this morning on the podcast, but um, you know, it's a dream for an architect and urban designer planner to plan a car free community like we visited, we visit them in Europe, we visit them in all sorts of foreign countries. But um, when cul de sac came to us and said, hey, we have this vision, uh, we want to, we want to do a pilot car free community we want it to be the largest in the country. And ultimately, we want to do a car free city like are you interested And like well of course we're interested yes sign us up and. Um, uh, so the, the, the development company and the project is called cul-de-sac. Um, they actually have a project um, in the works here in Atlanta. You've probably seen it in the news along the belt line. Um, we're not involved in that particular project, but this is, it's about a 16-acre site. Uh, it's actually grown because now the corner has been attained, a uh, little under 700 units. And um, what I... What was really important about this project and, and kudos to cul-de-sac is there was a pre-approved project on this site that had the sort of typical seven story double loaded corridor kind of dumb buildings, right? Stamped with three seven story parking garages and the project didn't pencil out. So it just sat, the site just sat there. And so it was an opportunity for cul-de-sac come in and say, hey, we can actually get almost as many units on the site at three, two and three stories because we're removing that parking in a much higher quality project. And um, the other thing is we were very thoughtful about making sure the, the type of place, the, the site planning, the architecture and the public spaces, the landscape were all responsive to the extreme desert climate in, in Tempe. And obviously that approach would be different depending on where in the country we, we would be doing this and what the climate is. Um, but the idea is that it actually more reflects a historic center of a city that you might see in like Egypt or Italy or France. And it provides a shaded experience of walking from one corner of the project to the other in a very organic, informal, in, informal way. So this is just an image of uh, the main plaza uh, space in the series of these uh, courtyard buildings that develop a, a system of small, medium and large courtyards within a block. And um, you can imagine that the emergency access was a, a real fun uh, part of this project. We actually had a like a 50 page packet that was just about getting the fire uh, firemen um, to, to the third floor of these buildings. But uh, this isn't just an idea. It's actually, there's about almost 300 units mostly completed right now. I think the first renters are supposed to move in Sometime soon, the first business, uh, a taqueria just opened up um, and we're super excited as just out there uh, about a month ago uh, to see this progress. And, you know, this, this design thinking is, we call this the missing middle kit of parts, is like, what are the building types that are the ingredients for the placemaking? And so for this project, 
we challenged ourselves to design a series of really simple bar-shaped buildings and L-shaped buildings that we just put together in different ways to provide a, an informal and irregular a block pattern within the project. And these are, uh, there are some single story units and some double story units. So if pretty typical configuration is a ground floor flat that's fully accessible, you go up an exterior set of stairs into this door and then this unit has two stories. So it's like a townhouse stacked on top of the flat on the ground floor. And this is the image that everybody uh, really loves. That kind of really reinforces the idea of a strong sense of community uh, and the social aspect that was a really important part of the project from the from the very beginning. Uh, just a, one of the examples of a block with some of the interior courtyard spaces, very purposefully, very compact, uh, because the shading is super important when it's 115 degrees outside and you're trying to get from your house to the transit station at the opposite corner of the site, or you just wanna, you wanna sit in a courtyard and read a book or hang out with your friend and, and have a drink. So uh, that's really important. And this is a typical street. We actually didn't call them streets, right? Once you move, remove the car from the equation, you can get really creative about how narrow these paseos can be. And every single unit has a address on this public paseo and a door that takes them directly out onto the courtyard spaces. So the units are 16 feet deep. So they have natural light on three sides and they also can provide passive cross ventilation and cooling um, for the buildings. And this is a, a slide from cul-de-sac and, and um, yes, it's car free, but more importantly, it's mobility rich. And part of cul-de-sac strategy is they're, they're, they're giving residents a package of discounted mobility, discount on uh, the regional transit authority passes, discounts on car share, discounts on bike and scooter share, discounts on deliveries. And it's almost like a digital concierge of sorts is kind of the way that I like to think about it. And so that it's not just simply about taking the cars away and hoping the residents will, will be okay, but actually thinking very carefully and thoughtfully about um, uh, how, how, the, how the residents will, will function on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, this design thinking is a very collaborative, multidisciplinary process. Uh, many of you have probably participated in some multi-day multi uh, charrette processes. Uh, very early on, we had the cul-de-sac team in our offices with our landscape architect who is based in, in Phoenix, Tempe. Uh, we had our retail consultant to make sure we had viable amounts of spaces and the right kinds of spaces. And it's just a, it was a really uh, super creative, very energetic process. And that was a one of the original site plans. But the other thing that's really cool is public art became a really important component of this project from the very beginning. So they just recently um, had a series of local artists uh, 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 introduce a, a handful of murals in really great locations within the project that really start to, to bring it to life. And um, this is just one of the blocks. And so you can imagine like, this is a very atypical block. It's a small block. It makes for a really fine grain pedestrian scale walking experience. There is one primary courtyard in each of these inner blocks and then a series of smaller spaces that are secondary and tertiary in nature. Just another photo. Um, this is a really important sort of note is that the, the architecture in this project is very thoughtfully restrained. And the idea was that um, we wanted to let the buildings play their role as fabric buildings, which means they are defining the public spaces and activating the public spaces. And they're, they're not a look at me building, but rather they're just playing the role in the larger sort of community uh, building and placemaking. And so a lot of great precedents like the Barrio Viejo in Tucson, setting those precedents, some precedents from Egypt, uh, Hassan Fathi was a, really interesting Egyptian architect we studied and in introducing elements, um, you know, being thoughtful about making sure long sides of buildings don't face west or in limited ways, shading devices on south sides, limited large openings on west and south sides. So we were very thoughtful about, uh, about that architecturally. And um, this project, sort of the day it was launched publicly was, was people were really super interested in, in it. It got 335 million press impressions the first day that was in the Wall Street Journal. So people, people are paying attention to this. It's super, super interesting. And I like this 
a quote from Curb Magazine. It's a big vision for a small slice of the city, but it might just be the future of safer, more sustainable neighborhoods. So it's like, yes, they, they get it. And there's, last I knew there were approximately 11,000 people on an interested list of living in this community. So it's proving there's demand and that's really what's, what's most important about a project like this. So the second case study I wanna talk about and it's just, I just wanted to show a couple slides on this one. It's a project that's on the boards in our office right now. And it's, it's really interesting as planners to think about this, like how would you enable this? It's interesting to think about, to architects be thinking about the courtyard typology, but it's rethinking unit size, typology, and what density means or doesn't mean. So this is a two and three story building. It's on an 80 foot by 72 foot lot. It's an infill site in Santa Maria, California, and it's 129 dwelling units per acre. So how does it achieve that? So the only way that this was possible is the city just did a downtown plan and they removed density caps from their zoning completely. And that's the only way this is possible because it, their zoning defines the form and scale they want, but it lets the developer decide what size of units and what density. This is super interesting. And so the way it does this, and this is the fault with a density-based system, is there's no unit over 350 square feet. And I think there's actually a market for this in every single neighborhood in the country. And I would say like 95% of zoning does not allow this kind of type. And this is a, a super great way for somebody on a with a limited income to live in a place that they really want to live in, right, at a certain point in their life. And this is a courtyard typology that we really like. No corridors, super efficient building, parked at about quarter. So how many of you, this is a question for, I guess, anybody in the audience, but particular planners, how many of you have seen a zoning district that allows up to 100 dwelling units per acre, but caps the height at two or three stories? This is where our system is failing, right? Is, is our planning system thinks that 100 dwelling units per, 120 dwelling units per acre is a, like a 15, 16, 17 story building. And we need to sort of shift that system of like, why not have a zoning district if you're gonna have density that says, we want high density, but we want house scale or missing middle scale. That's the way to do, one way to do it. Or let's count a unit under 700 square feet or 500 square feet as half a unit if we're gonna have density. So there's some really creative ways to address this. The third case study is about um, redefining multifamily with missing middle housing. And um, some of you may have seen this, but how did we ever get to the point where we thought that this was a great location in a great format to build the highest density housing that our zoning allows? Like who wants to live there? Like, and it's only valuable like the first five years of its life because then once it's not new, it's less attractive because that's the only thing it has going for it. So we used to know how to do this. We used to integrate, you know, great missing middle typologies. And so we actually took on a project. Um, it's in the Omaha, Nebraska Metro. I'm, I grew up in Nebraska and I can tell you that Nebraska is not known for innovation in the development industry. So I was super excited that, that Jerry Reimer, our client, came to us, and we hadn't done a greenfield project in about 10 years as a commitment to creating more sustainable sort of walkable infill, but we thought this was a perfect opportunity to disrupt the multifamily industry and show them that missing middle housing in a walkable neighborhood format can outcompete a dumb garden apartment project in the suburbs. And so um, the very basic thesis of this, which is pretty straightforward, but it's like, let's design a building that looks like a mansion, nice attractive building, actually pretty simple to build, not that expensive, but let's put seven units in it, right? Pretty straightforward, but most zoning codes actually don't, don't allow that in a lot of places, right? Even though it's the, the form and the scale and behaves like a house, so that was the premise behind this plan. So it's 40 acres 
Uh, it's a little over 600 units ultimately, taking out the, the required open space for the creek corridors and the setbacks from the lake. But you can see that we have this pellet of missing middle typologies that go from duplex up to eightplex. We call this the missing middle neighborhood kit. And what's great is it's now about 300 units occupied and it's outperforming every multifamily project in the entire Omaha Metro, like by four outperforming. And one of our requirements to work on this project was that we would recreate a main street in the project with ground floor flex spaces to really reinforce the walkability, right? Who, who doesn't wanna be able to walk to the coffee shop or the pizza shop and on a Friday evening. And so what was interesting is from the very beginning, a pizza shop actually showed up. We didn't actually expect it. Like three months into the project, a pizza shop showed up and opened up in this little 500 square foot space. And now they have the, the one next to it. And our client's gonna build a larger sort of restaurant space across the street for that growing business. And there's like a yoga studio and a coffee shop that's coming. And so that's an important part of the walkability. Um, so you could drive through this project, walk through this project and never know that these aren't just the big or medium sized houses. They're not even really big, big buildings, but you can see these are the number of units in each of the housing types. And this was a challenge for us from a typology design, but also from an architecture standpoint is how can we design buildings that look good, but can be built at a price point that our client can right, justify in terms of what the typical rents are in the Omaha Metro. And we think we came to a pretty, pretty nice uh, solution here. And you can even see some, some accessory dwelling units above the parking. Uh, this is the parking lot. That's a pretty nice parking lot, isn't it? So this project is my response to everybody saying, well, you can't just park one space per unit because there's no transit. People are gonna drive. This par project is parked one space per unit off street and the rest of the parking is provided on street. And it's still out, it's still outperforming every other project. Like the, the typical concern is like, oh, people don't wanna park on the street. People need a garage, it's Nebraska, it snows. People wanna live in a neighborhood first and foremost, right? They wanna live in a typology that they don't have to walk down a 300 foot corridor to get to their unit. They go straight to their door from their stoop or their porch. Um, and what our client loves about this from the put the developer's cap on, he's building a street and the city's taking ownership and the city's maintaining his parking lot. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's inefficiencies or, perceived inefficiencies in terms of like, oh, there's a lot more exterior building envelope, but there's other efficiencies in terms of, hey, we can be more compact in our footprint by just creating really pedestrian scaled streets with on-street parking that people love to park here and walk up to their front door and be able to see their car outside their front window. Um, and this seems to be everybody's favorite. It's, uh, I think it's now finished, but this is the mansion apartment. That's the basically the direct interpretation of that initial sketch we did with seven units in it um, that, that's uh, facing onto the Lake Drive. And so we're about to launch a missing middle neighborhood kit online and sell these uh, prototypes um, in order to really maximize our impact in the spread of the missing middle in the multifamily industry across the country. Um, really quickly, just wanted to, to show this. I, I participated in a really great panel at ULI um, uh, last fall, and we talked about multi-generational housing, and missing middle housing is just a great way. I, I keep reading articles, you know, like Wall Street Journal, New York Times, that they're trying to take a big suburban house and like, oh, they add an ADU, but I'm just like, well, do those people really want to be living in a, on a cul-de-sac in a total car-dependent place where your grandma might live in that ADU, but she's trapped? So like, part of the idea is like, let's think about walkable neighborhoods, let's think about missing middle typologies, and how they respond to this cultural desire, growing cultural desire to live with multiple um, generations under one rooftop. And then there's just the need, right? Because of the cost of housing of like, so like you have, this is example, the main unit for the core family, you have grandma's wing that you can close off with the door being shut. And then you have the boomerang sort of young adult unit in the back. 
all oriented around a courtyard and you can mirror this and have a really great sixplex courtyard housing typology. And um, just a really interesting way to look at this. And so I'm gonna shift now to um, talking about our public sector work because it's about, our practice is about a little over half public sector and the other percentage with uh, private sector clients. And so um, this work is about establishing place-based and form-based frameworks for cities, counties, and regions. And I think that idea of, of how, how planning is rooted in the culture, the geography, and the physical attributions of a place is something that we kind of left behind in our planning practice for some reason at some point. And so um, this camera was built about the same year that Euclidean zoning was first applied. How many of you are using that, a photo, a camera like that to send a, to do an Instagram post or to send an email to a friend? We still, it's the only oper operating system that I know of that's over a hundred years old that we're still using or trying to use. We're trying to like put a Band-Aid on it or, so the reality is we really need to step back and rethink our zoning system because the other problem with it is if there's obviously a really, we have a really horrible history, both at the federal level and the local level of really racist practices in our policy, in our planning, in our zoning. And most city zoning maps were actually initially based on the red line maps. So it's pretty, it's, we really need to sort of evolve for a lot of different reasons. And we need, we need to think outside the box. And if you had asked me when I was in undergraduate school studying architecture, or you told me I'd be rewriting zoning codes, as part of my practice, I would have like I would have thought like you're totally crazy. But our very first public sector project, we created a vision and we realized that there were like 50 regulatory barriers in the way. And so we wrote our first form-based code in 2000, 1999-2000. And I'll tell you that the planning staff at the time of the county that we were working with thought we were completely insane. <laughs> They're like, what language are you speaking? We're like, we're talking about placemaking here. And, and Missing Middle was inherent in that. And I think for those of you that, uh, what I like about um, urban design is it, it's where planning and architecture come together. That's why I'm thrilled to be here sort of speaking to the urban design students and program as well as others. But where that all comes together for us is building typology. And so, as I said before, typo these typologies, we did a citywide form-based code for Cincinnati, Ohio, now almost 10 years ago. And we documented this entire palette of typologies that exist in Cincinnati. And the idea was we pick which of these types make sense in which neighborhoods, and then we rewrite, rewrite the zoning code to implement that, that concept in those range of housing types. Um, so we, over the last five to six years, have really refined our missing middle consulting for public sector clients because we realized to maximize our impact, we can't get caught up working for one city for five years, get caught up in the debate. So we've developed this, what we call the missing middle scan and the missing middle deep dive. And what we do like from a big picture perspective, we identify geographically where a city or a county should prioritize missing middle. And then in the missing middle deep dive, we actually specifically tell you what zoning changes you need to make. And instead of us making them, we have this planning staff make them because it's really targeted. You need to change the maximum density from this to this. You need to change the setback from this to this. And so we can do this really quickly and then move on to the next city. And if they can bring us back in for consulting as needed, we've done this for uh, Greenville, South Carolina, both the county and the city. And what was really cool about this is they were in the process of doing their comprehensive plan and say they took the missing middle priority map and put it right next to their future land use map. And it became policy of like, this is where we are prioritizing the application of missing middle housing. And it relates to the land use and starts talking sort of form and scale. Um, this is sort of some typical, that's that map that I priority areas. And then we do this, what we call these test fits um, for each of the zoning districts. And we, what's really important about this is we actually identify 
very few cities do this. What are typical lot sizes in each of your zoning districts? Like pick the, get into your GIS system. What are the typical widths and depths in each of the five uh, zoning districts that you wanna look at? We do a idealized build out, and then the zoning is just reverse engineered to allow that end result to happen. It seems really straightforward, but we don't see this happening very often. And so we also did this in Greensboro, North Carolina fairly recently. We just finished Athens, Georgia. Um, you can take a look at those or talk to them about it. But um, this was just the map of the Greensboro's missing middle priority areas. Um, they also had just completed their comprehensive plan right before we came in. So they're using, they had generally prioritized missing middle in their comp plan, but they're using this as an implementation tool for their new comprehensive plan and, and they're uh, refining their zoning code. So we, we picked these five zoning districts working with the city staff. So you can see where they um, fit within that priority areas. We identify sites like this and this RM18. I never know how these places ever determine the names of these zoning districts. Um, 50 by 150 foot lot. And immediately, like this only takes us like two minutes to identify. These are the allowed uses or allowed typologies, what we like to say. The only thing that's allowed in this zone on this lot is a single family home. And this is pretty common. I'd like you to do that, this test, simply because of minimum lot size on that 50 by 150 foot lot, which is a large percentage of that zoning district, you can only build a single family home. So guess what? That's gonna be a really big McMansion that everybody complains about <laughs> in your community. And so it, the, the zoning district hypothetically allows multiple units, but the reality is when you're testing it, it doesn't. And so uh, sort of we go through testing different typologies, um, and what, what's super interesting about this is, I think this was, you know, I think it was in Greenville, typical 50 foot wide lot, the zoning district allowed single family, multifamily, but for single family, the side setbacks were only five feet, but for multifamily, it was 20 feet. <laughs> so like, how did somebody not recognize that there's only a 10 foot strip of development potential left on your most common lot size, like how does that happen? So they obviously, there was this mentality that when you add a unit, you need to double the size of the lot and that's antithetical to allowing and enabling missing middle to happen. Um, a lot of our most recent um, zoning reform work is what we call zoning toolkits. And once again, we started just like every other practice doing corridor plans, downtown plans, neighborhood plans, neighborhood form based codes. But what we've realized is we can have the biggest impact at the county and the regional scale. And so we're doing these zoning toolkits. And um, uh, many of you, especially the students, were in grade school when this book was published. It's, but um, form based codes, uh, 2009 published and it's still super relevant. It's not a, it's not an easy read like my missing middle book because it's super technical. Um, but what's really interesting about this is in this book, we lay out this process that we call macro scale analysis and micro scale analysis. And that's exactly what we still use in these missing middle scans to identify the characteristics of a place and serve as a foundation for uh, all of these planning and zoning efforts. So I think it's actually more relevant today than, than even when it was published. Uh, so uh, a really interesting project, uh, Marin County, California. So if you haven't been following California housing legislation, we have like 50 housing bills that have passed in the last three years and they're all really great, but it's, wow, it's, it's hard to follow. But the, the state was giving funding to implement what was called SB 35, which is required every city to have objective design standards. It means there can't be a single line in your zoning code or architectural guidelines that is, sub, can be subjectively interpreted. Like you can't say the building should be pedestrian scale, right? It's like, okay, that's a recipe to put a project through a ringer. It's like, how tall should that be? Where should the building be set back or, or build to? And so 
ABAG MTC, which is a regional planning organization, were smart enough to say, they approached Marin County and the 10 jurisdictions within the county and said, let's hire Opticos, let's pool our money, let's create a zoning toolkit that every jurisdiction can share and implement more effectively. And so I think people, most people thought this was never gonna succeed because if you know Marin County, it's like the bastion for say no to everything. Um, and very little development has happened in Marin County in the last 50 to 60 years. So all the planning directors met every other week. And I'd say a majority of them weren't really positive at the beginning of this, thinking that it was gonna work. And um, this one, the Driehaus Form-Based Code Award, just about a month ago, look it up, the Smart Growth America Form-Based Code Institute, which is a nonprofit that I helped co-found uh, about 16 or 17 years ago. But I was almost fell out of my chair when one of those planning directors that was super resistant to this was talking about form-based elements. And if you know the transect, the urban to rural transect, he was talking about transect terminology. And I about like fell out of my chair that this guy like really understood the value of this place-based system. And um, where it really struck a chord with both those planning directors, the staff and the decision makers, the county board of supervisors, the city council members, when we showed them the documentation we did of every single one of these jurisdictions mapping photographs, both quantitative and qualitative analysis. And we could begin to, to show them what characteristics that we've identified in their community, what they think we should add and how the new zoning is gonna reinforce that unique quality of each of their places. And so um, this is, I know place types is a little bit um, overused as a planning term, but this, this is what really resonated with uh, both decision makers and planners. And so the document has a bunch of chapters and the difference between the toolkit and a approach like a, a model code is that instead of needing to do a bunch of work to add things like a model code you often have to do, there's about 90% of what any city or county will need in this document and they only pull off the shelf the pieces that they need. So some of the smaller jurisdictions only use like three of these 12 chapters and other jurisdictions want to use all 12, including the architecture design guidelines. So they have the choice uh, what tools in this toolkit they want to use, just highly graphic. Um, and it's not just sitting on the shelf. Over half of the jurisdictions, the county just adopted it last week. Over half the jurisdictions are in the process of adopting this code. So huge, huge win for um, sort of delivery of housing choices. Uh, the next um, type of project is, is place-based comprehensive plans. And um, we have actually been part of three comprehensive plans that have won the Daniel Burnham National APA Award over the last six years. And it sort of introduces all these concepts of placemaking, place types, uh, form-based approaches to planning and coding. It's the Memphis 3.0 plan, uh, the Kauai County general plan update and plan Cincinnati. And, um, how we ended up getting the Memphis 3.0 plan is they had a typical RFP out and we just submitted a really short, like two or three pages saying you would have to be crazy to hire a white led California based firm to lead this comprehensive plan update based on your culture and the history of your city, but we'd be more than happy to collaborate with you to build your staff to build some local expertise and do strategic advising and so that's what we ended up doing. Um, in this Memphis 3.0 comprehensive plan. And um, really, really neat. I mean, the city made a real commitment to encouraging reinvestment back in inner city neighborhoods. And they actually de-annexed a bunch of cities on the edges of the uh, sort of areas on the edges of the city because they realized that they couldn't, they couldn't actually pay for themselves. So that's a hugely controversial um, uh, and de uh, they froze sewer, sewer extensions as well. And so part of this is we as people who don't live in a community, we're not embedded in the community, like we don't know the networks, but we want to find those groups, those organizations that have those networks in place that, that are trusted, that we can just simply participate in those discussions. And so that was why this there were 45 neighborhood partners in this process, and it was the most extensive, most 
successful process that I've seen in getting people, community members to the table that wouldn't typically show up for a planning process. And this is very much a plan based on sort of identifying those physical characteristics of each neighborhood. And, you know, we as planners, a lot of times sort of have this term called centers that we talk about, like a center of a community. And um, it didn't resonate at all with the, the communities. Like we, we were talking about it, showing pictures, but what we realized is what started resonating is this idea of an anchor, an anchor of a community. An anchor could be anything from a neighborhood corner store to a place of worship, to a small public space that exists. And so we, we, I, we adopted that terminology so that it was because we realized it was something that community members really understood and it resonated with them. Um, it's really important whenever we do a comprehensive plan of identifying the desired degree of change in each neighborhood, because some neighborhoods, the policy is such that you're going to want major transformation and major change, and other neighborhoods where you're just going to want more incremental, more thoughtful, both public sector and private sector investment. So we very carefully identified um, this, and uh, John Zena, who's the planning director for Memphis, did a really great article for, I think it was Planning Magazine, on degree of change and comprehensive plans. And um, this is always really great to see. So the first year after adoption, 70% of investment took place in the anchors and the anchor neighborhoods identified in the plan. So we have since done seven small area plans. We did citywide urban design guidelines and now we're working on a citywide zoning code update with the, the city's team. So it's been a really great working relationship with the city. And then the, I just wanted to mention this because obviously a very different type of place culturally and physically, but a place-based approach and place-based typologies was a very successful approach for this Kauai County a comprehensive plan as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through these last few very quickly, but what we realized in a place like California and a lot of places across the country that are very planning heavy is the comprehensive plan came out and it sort of said all these really lofty things, lofty policies, but there was nothing to implement effective strategies and steps, especially for the delivery of housing. Like we wanna deliver housing choice. Okay, well, what does that mean for neighborhood A or neighborhood B or downtown adjacent or suburban? And so we started doing these housing plans that basically do what a city should be doing in their comprehensive plan. And a lot of times it's done and it can just directly plug into and inform the comprehensive plans housing policy. And this is for Modesto, California. It's a medium-sized town, sort of the very outskirts of the, 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 the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area metro. And what, what was really important about this is that we stopped talking about housing generally and we started talking about more specifically, or what are the strategies for delivering housing and what types of housing for each of these different context types? You know, obviously downtown is one type of housing solution. Downtown transition is another, and then downtown adjacent neighborhoods. So what, is the, what are those kit of parts um, that are, should be part of your housing solution? And what was super uh, effective in terms of communicating to community members and decision makers in Modesto was when we actually started talking about specific household compositions and types of households and related that to the types of housing that the city should be delivering. So it's not just generically we need to be providing housing, but what are the broad spectrum of household types and what types of housing do um, they, are they interested in living in and what types of places? So, um, what I want to mention is, once again, back to these really detailed test fits on typical lot sizes. And you can see here where we're starting to integrate that missing middle sweet spot concept of like, is that test feasible? Yes, in this instance, it's not actually delivering attainable priced housing. And so we can turn the dials on policy and zoning regulations based on how those performance. And just, you know, it, we like to be visual, like, you know, a lot of cities are thinking about small infill sites, but what about these un underutilized corridors? And why couldn't those corridors become really great missing middle communities with some smaller retail along the corridors themselves? And so um, one of the most exciting projects we're working on right now is the Sacramento, California Missing Middle Housing Study. The council adopted a policy that they wanted to allow more units on all lots across the city to, to get ahead of their 
escalating housing prices. Um, so uh, we are excited to work with them. But uh, I think um, what's, what, what's really super interesting about this, and I think every single one of our projects should have this, is the city specifically requested this displacement risk analysis, right? And we're partnering with a, a firm called Cascadia that has set up this really amazing data-driven process to demonstrate what, what impact and potential displacement can result from zoning and policy changes. I think that's really, really important. I think especially in, say, sort of back to Atlanta now, based on what I saw six years ago, I feel like displacement right now, I mean, I'm sure, sure you're having really big, big and important conversations about it because it seems like the development has really spread into every neighborhood, even those that were sort of historically black and brown in the city. And um, we just need to be thoughtful about that is we don't want to push out existing residents. We want to give them some housing stability as well. And um, this was a uh, Missing Middle Roadshow poster series that we created that traveled around the city we attended some of these, the city of staff uh, sort of led most of these after we did the first, and it just gave people the opportunity to, to ask specific questions and learn about what the strategy for integrating Missing Middle was for Modesto. And so just a, a few last slides on collaborations, and um, a about four years ago, I'm sure you heard about the California wild wildfires on the news, uh, tens of thousand people left homeless. Uh, Habitat for Humanity Sonoma County was smart enough and proactive enough to say, hey, we need to play a role in delivering housing for the people who lost their homes. So we collaborated with Marianne Casado, who designed the Katrina Cottages, and we um, worked with Habitat Son Sonoma to develop this prototypical cottage court community. A local um, corporate entity actually donated the land on their corporate campus to do this pilot project. The idea was, is let's test these typologies, uh, pre-manufactured, partially manufactured SIPs panels, different uh, construction methodologies, and then be able to use these in the backyards of those houses that got burned down so they can provide temporary homes while those houses get rebuilt. So a really interesting case study uh, to learn a lot from. Um, I'm super thrilled that um, we have about a five-year working relationship with AARP, um, their technical advisory work, where we've done presentations, general education, walking tours. Um, we've done online uh, Zoom sort of site planning exercises, and we just released a, a joint publication with AARP. If you just Google Missing Middle Housing and AARP, it's a really nice publication that's very approachable. Uh, to people without a, a sort of technical planning or design background. And part of this is most recently is just illustrating how a single existing single family home can evolve and grow into a triplex and provide passive income for the residents and do it in a way that doesn't really impact the scale and quality and character of, of the, uh, the community. So that's really important work. And just illustrating to to community members, like, what does it mean to have a fourplex on a, on a lot in your neighborhood, just to show that these are house scale buildings that won't have that negative impact. And then the last was just working with NAHB, National Association of Home Builders, to analyze uh, zoning changes that cities are making across the country to enable these broad range of housing types. So I just encourage you to to take a look at this as well. And so concluding thoughts, um, I think about this way too much. Uh, I did this a few weeks ago when I was playing Monopoly with my 13 year old son. Um, I created a cottage court out of the Monopoly pieces. Um, maybe I was trying to be a real estate baron or something, I don't know. But um, I, I think it's, I, what I love about these presentations is there's always, a really broad range of expertise in the room. And I really feel like it's gonna take every single one of us in those different areas of expertise to successfully respond to the housing crisis in a place like Atlanta, especially with such a hot, crazy housing market. And um, right, simply based on demand, Chris Nelson did this research for my book, 60% of all housing built between now and 2040 would need to be missing middle to meet the demand. That's not even the need, that's just the demand. <laughs> so like we have a pretty um, 
we have a pretty uh, high bar to, to look at to get over. And a, a lot of this to me is like, let's stop talking about density and FAR and all these abstract numbers. Let's start talking about typologies, how people live in them, how they foster a sense of community. Like almost everybody at some point in their life has either lived in a missing middle typology. They have a kid that lives in one. They have a best friend that lives in one. They have one on their street they live in that have, have friends live in. So a lot of this, we, we try to personalize the conversation. And um, I am gonna, we're gonna sell some books through the university bookstore after this. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So if you want to sort of join my network, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to, to have you join. I'm less active on Twitter, Instagram, but our OptiCoast accounts are pretty active. And um, it's kind of like, I like to leave with a call to action, right? I, I do feel like we all do need to step up and we all need to play a role. And I think um, without each one of us, whether it's going to a city council meeting and saying, I support missing middle in my neighborhood or being the architect that's designing it or being the developer who's proposing something that sort of breaks every rule in a city and sort of sort of has the, the will to sort of take it through that process. Or you're a realtor, you're AARP, sort of helping sort of spread the missing middle word in education. So um, I'm excited. Atlanta needs all of your help. Um, like I said earlier, I feel like there's a, there's a really small crack in your window that's still open in terms of opportunity to address this, but it's closing pretty rapidly. And so it's gonna take every single one of you and your expertise to address this housing issue in the Atlanta Metro. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. All right, I'm going to change the lighting and we're gonna go sit over there. Yeah, if you wanna, um, let's see. So camera controls, I'm going to two and lighting. Lighting, I'm going to two and all right. So a uh, reminder, everyone, slido.com is where you want to, and if you want to ask any more questions, slido.com and the code is 35-34-262. So damn, there's a lot of questions. We're never going to get through them all. I'm going to try. I will. I will try to select um, the most popular. One of the most popular questions came in really early. How do you address the neighborhood concern that missing middle would be more profitable and therefore overtake surrounding patterns? Yeah, I, is that I, a good thing or is that a bad thing? Is that part of the displacement risk? Well, I I think um, we need to be thinking about it absolutely in terms of displacement and, and what it means to the existing community for sure. And this um, displacement risk analysis that we're now doing in Sacramento is a great case study. I think it's, it's there's not one solution that's the same, gonna be the same for every city or every neighborhood. So I think that's a critical part of the planning process in the regulatory process. But I also, I see a lot of um, cities well-intended, actually a lot of states well-intended, not to be named, um, and they actually unleash more housing on an individual lot in a way that um, delivers big, expensive new homes. Uh, let me just, this, uh, Berkeley's, or Berkeley, California and the Bay Area is a bit of an extreme generally, but, um, you have to pay $1.2 million for a thousand square foot bungalow. Um, a developer in a certain zoning district that we're seeing found a loophole. He can tear that $1.2 million home down and build four tall, skinny, single family detached houses that are about 2,000 square feet and they go for $1.6 million. So you're delivering more housing, but you're not delivering attainable housing and it's in an urban form that's quite horrible actually. So, and if you just take that in terms of like, compare that to what it might cost to, to buy a home in, in a neighborhood in yours, and you can just imagine like, you, you have to think about what typologies are you incentivizing? What size of units are you incentivizing? And how is it achieving that attainability in terms of that missing middle sweet spot? And I would say, 
I did a I did a couple of presentations recently on the top five mistakes that I'm seeing. And if you just Google Smart Growth Network, I had a thousand people attend. Um, this is one of them is like unleashing too much. And, and so you have to be really thoughtful about it. And part of it's that um, economic analysis of what is it going to cost to either rent or buy one of those units that you're um, enabling with your new, new zoning and planning. Now, it's really interesting because I think so much of the attention has really been on anti-displacement policies. So let's play with the tax code. Let's play. I mean, there's a variety of mostly tax-based, but uh, there are land trusts and uh, other mechanisms. But you're really trying to get at the, how the zoning is controlling the design of what yeah, gets just built. As an not example, just, yeah, and it, just Sacramento, just like any other big city, medium-sized city, the most likely place that development's going to happen is in the lower value areas, right? That have historically been had values depressed. So um, I'm not saying this is the, the the same everywhere in Sacramento. It just happens to be uh, the black and brown neighborhoods. And so, like, if the city doesn't do something to equally as incentivize missing middle in other neighborhoods, all of the new development's going to focus on those areas, and it's going to push a lot of people out of those neighborhoods in a way that nobody wants to see. So uh, there's quite a few questions on this topic. Um, one that's gotten several votes is how is Opticos accounting for affordability in their higher density housing types? What protections are afforded to protect income sensitive target markets? Yeah, so um, a, a lot of a majority of our projects are are the goal is to deliver attainability by design. And that's, you can usually do that in most markets with good design to about 60% of the median income for a household with about 60 to 70% of the median income. If the, if the household is below that, it's usually going to require some sort of incentive to, to make those housing, that housing attainable. Um, so I think um, the primary focus of the work we're doing isn't what we call capital A affordable, which is that below 60% median income, it's usually the, the lower A attainable of like that 60% and above. And it's harder to do in really hot markets. But um, so in some ways, there needs to be a combination of, of attainability by design with thoughtful typologies being introduced. To be honest, the biggest opportunities are areas where there are single family homes that haven't already unleashed large development potential with thoughtful missing middle application. There's capital A affordable with subsidies. And then there's just the need to generally increase the volume and the number of homes we're delivering because we've gotten behind. So one of the, 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 the boats keep coming in. They keep, keep they're, uh, as to which questions. And the, the most uh, popular right now is perhaps the nerdiest what were some of your innovative fire accessibility solutions for cul-de-sac? Yeah, so um, one of them was, if you might have noticed, there's a major east-west paseo that we call the spine. And it made sense to keep that because that's where actually a lot of the existing infrastructure was already. Um, and that became a major fire and emergency access route. But then from the perimeter of the project, we have stubs and we very carefully mapped the fire hose distance to make sure that you know we had the, the correct distances for the fire to reach every corner of the building. And then we also designed these chimney elements on the buildings that you might have noticed that actually had a ladder internal to them. So those to get up to those are for the firefighters to climb up. Yes, and then also mapping the path for them to get up to the roof of a second story wing, which enabled them to get into the third floor. So it was it was a it was a major effort um, on our part, our client's part, to make the case for that. And you were still bit. getting twenty foot wide clearance on the stubs. Yeah, and so. Um, and we just, we, we were super thoughtful about when we're, we're designing those few paseos that had to be wider for emergency access to make sure that they weren't any wider than they needed to be and that they were 
just visually mitigated by tree plantings and pushing the buildings up as close as we could to the right of way. So. Another question, we got a, quite a few questions on cul-de-sac. How do you address concerns about noise in the courtyards or between units? You've got these really, some of these, bar, the bar buildings are only eight feet apart from each other. Um, I mean, obviously sound attenuation is thought about very carefully in the building in terms of vertical and horizontal limit, limiting sound attenuation. Um, if you've ever been to a European city and you swing open the shutters for Central American, South American, and the sounds of the city are quite amazing, actually, to me. I actually feel like it's an undervalued part of experiencing a really great urban place. So I feel like, I mean, there's not going to be parties in the courtyard, right? There's, this is going to be a managed, there's management on site for, for the project, but there's, a hum, there's going to be a hum of activity and that's going to be part of that experience. If you don't want that, you, you probably won't choose to live in, in cul-de-sac Tempe. I mean, to be honest, and we're not saying that that's a lifestyle for everybody. We're saying there's such a big demand for this car-free living that nobody can deliver to. And this is sort of cracking into the delivery of this pent-up demand for car-free living. How did you, what were the largest battles you had with the city in get, of Tempe in getting cul-de-sac permitted? How did you ultimately convince them to move forward? Yeah, so what, what's super interesting is Tempe is notorious for being a really hard place to get entitlement. Um, in, in terms of, in Arizona, it's probably the toughest or one of the toughest. And I mean, this is pretty much the case in most of the project I showed, but uh, political support is, is really important that the mayor, the council members, the city manager, like are get really excited about a project. I mean, who, what city wouldn't wanna be on the cover of the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, right? Saying like, we've, You're we're the future. first city to accommodate a car-free project of this scale in the United States. Like, I think it just, it makes a lot of sense. And so the process was really collaborative with the staff. It enabled them to think outside of their box a little bit, obviously as well, but, um, it got entitled fairly quickly. I think it was no longer than nine months. It might've been as short as six months, which for California standards, that's like lightning yeah. speed for somebody who so, lives in California. One more question on cul-de-sac. Well, not on cul-de-sac, that now we're branching out a little. Uh, how do your projects support mixed income communities? Because it seems like you're providing a lot of kind of one bedroom units or, or, or similar size units. Um, so are you really getting a mix of incomes or? So it's a great question, but if just, I'll use the Prairie Queen, the Omaha missing middle neighborhood as an example is the smallest apartment, one bedroom rents for about a thousand dollars a month and the largest unit rents for $3,000 a month. So there's mixed income there in a way that no other multifamily project delivers. And the HUD people, HUD, group toured the site and they were shocked that there was a, a person living in a thousand square foot unit on the same block as somebody 3000. And there's one woman in particular and she, our, our client loves her and like can't get rid of her, but she is so excited. She's one of the people living in that thousand square foot or that thousand dollar unit. She's like, I've never lived in a neighborhood or haven't in the last 10, 15 years of my life where there's a doctor just down the street that like I rub elbows with we're out walking our dogs and we, you know, we get to know each other. And so that, I think that economic diversity is actually really important to a, a healthy, vibrant community for sure. And um, I would say cul-de-sac has less of a size variation in units, but what we're finding is the baby boomers are showing up in much higher numbers. And this happens in every single one of our projects. Our clients are always like, Oh, baby boomers, they're not gonna, they're not gonna do this. They want to live in walkable places, they want to live in car-free communities, and they want to be able to walk down their steps to a coffee shop, to the to the grocery store. So uh, really uh it's it's inherent in what we do. Could it be like the the Omaha project would be better if it was a mix of for sale and for rent, but as a as a model for to demonstrate that missing middle can be successful at volume and be a 
competitive business model um, is, is part of why we were really excited about and continue to be excited so about picking it. Picking up on the Omaha project, Prairie mm -hmm. Queen, the question, was the developer an apartment developer? And, and how do we convince here? How do we convince multifamily companies to consider new models? Um, so Jerry Reimer was our client and he had, he was a, to be honest, he was a little bit of an unusual developer. He actually uh, started his development company by buying historic multiplexes in Midtown Omaha that were worth almost nothing 10 years ago and renovating them and delivering to this growing demand for walkable living. So he understood, right, he understood that market. And he had, he had 200 units within a 10 minute walk of a couple of different neighborhoods. So it's clustered, um, clustered uh, units that he could manage fairly, fairly easily. He then went off and developed a, like that green, one of those sort of uh, suburban garden apartment projects in the far edge of Omaha. And he said it bored him to tears to do it after developing, but he said, you know what? It was so much easier than doing even just adaptive reuse of the historic buildings. He said, I can see why most of my developer colleagues like just keep repeating garden apartments because the city like has their system in place to like approve those. Whereas I come in and like, I wanna do a missing middle neighborhood and I can give you a list of 50 city regulations that don't enable this to happen. And so uh, he had just the right mix of expertise. Um, but what I will say is now that he's done it, no developer wants to be the first, <laughs> right? He's done it, and so others are copying it uh, to various successes in Omaha and other markets in the country. So I think that's part of it. It's, it's, it's now a proven model. It's won awards. It's been published. And so that's what the developers are sort of absorbing. And um, sorry, uh, one other thing is I embedded myself into ULI about five years ago to like help plant the seeds of the missing middle conversation amongst a lot of developers who probably five years ago wouldn't have been thinking about this. And there's a lot of um, interest in this from developers who weren't, weren't doing this type of development historically. I, so. I, I would expect the builders and builders. working with National Association yep. of Home Builders, yep. that's absolutely that's sort of how you mm -hmm. get some of the word out. And when you show your economic stats, I mean, that can gets I, the bankers. Can I mention one other thing because, um, what we have found is, unfortunately, it's not the big developers who are making the model, pro developing the model projects. They're just not willing or able to turn fast enough or change quickly enough. Um, but that being said is, uh, you know, once that model is created, I think that's, it's, it's, it's gonna continue to spread. So we've only got a few more minutes. Um, but one of the questions that I know often comes up in sort of the, the difference between archi studying architecture and studying urban design is, you know, the degree of creative creativity and the innovative aspirations of architects to, um, to really do something new. So the, the question is, how have you considered the creative and innovative aspirations of architects and designers within a growing set of standardized design practices being developed? Yeah. Um, first of all, I think most importantly is my main message is that the missing middle conversation is style neutral. Mm -hmm. um, the only reason that most of the imagery that we show in most organization show is more traditional is because that's when it was built. Like we haven't built a lot of it recently. Um, and uh, can the typologies we show be expressed in a more modern uh, vocabulary? Absolutely. Um, you could skin a lot of these typologies in a lot of different ways. Um, but what's most important is missing middle architecture is primarily an architecture of restraint. If you look at a lot of the best missing middle buildings, they are super simple. 
They play by the rules of good urban design. They have porches, not porches, they have windows, they have doors on the fronts. Maybe they have porches, maybe they don't. Um, but to be honest, I think it's a lot of times hard for architects to be restrained because these buildings wanna fit in, they don't wanna stand out. And they fit in in terms of scale. So the architectural expression should also fit in. Now, could it be Dutch modern? Absolutely. Like, yeah, I mean, we're doing a really interesting project in Seattle right now that is a pocket neighborhood, but it's a very modern vocabulary because that's what our client wanted to do. And so it's like, I think it's the missing middle conversation should be style neutral. It's not about architecture. It's not a debate about, is it this style or that style or historic or contemporary? It's like, we want to create community first and foremost. We want to create good housing and then a good design. Like I'm just a big fan of good design. I always tell my urban design students that one of the real differences between, you know, an, an architect generally only has to convince the one client uh, to spend, you know, a whole lot of money on what that ar the architect is proposing. But urban design, you have to convince an entire community. And that's where some of that restraint yeah. um, and, and, and the focus on the plate, this outdoor spaces, the public space, the design of public space, rather than focusing on the object. The other thing that's hardest to do as an architect is design, deliver good design within a budget, right? I worked for a number of firms in New York City where these projects were almost unlimited budgets. And it's pretty easy to do good design when you're designing a house for Michael Eisner or John Bon Jovi, right? Like I did that and it wasn't fulfilling to me. Like it was like, it was really beautiful places. But um, so when we like do our Muse housing projects, when our client says, I want to reach a price point 30,000 less than my townhouse, we're like, ah, oh, the challenge is on, right? Like we need to design a building that he can, deliver for that price point, but we want it to be a place that people are really excited to live in. And it doesn't sort of stick out from the other homes in the area. And so that's that's the biggest challenge is like, if you have an unlimited budget, like it's pretty easy to do really good design. But when you're on a really limited budget, working with a production builder, like you have to, you have to really be very, very thoughtful about where your client's spending money and where it's just a really simple building. So we have two more, two last questions I can't not, not ask. First one, as developers of color, how can we be prepared and position ourselves to work in these areas of black and brown people? I think some of the most innovative work that I've seen, and I know a couple of developers in Oakland, California that have been doing this is, I think the most, the best thing to do is to partner with longtime homeowner, homeowners in, in, in neighborhoods, those in those neighborhoods and help them deliver, help them develop an ADU, maybe partner, right? Do you have a, be a development partner, provide equity, provide development, construction, architecture, consulting so that they can stay in their community. They can create some passive income or maybe create an opportunity for other family members to live in a family compound of two or three units on a site. And I think that um, to me, that's the best way to to keep the people in the site and also like in a in a neighborhood that's feeling that pressure of you know a, a long time. This this happened in my neighborhood in Berkeley. A long time black homeowners who built the house in the 19, 1940s when a large black population moved to the Bay Area to work in the shipyards, and once that legacy homeowner passes away and their three kids like see a, a dollar sign of like a million dollars, we can take a million dollars and and go, or we can invest in that house. Most of them are like taking the money and going away. But like, I think that's short-term wealth. That's not as, it's, it's not building household wealth in the same way generationally as owning a piece of property in a neighborhood where the values are to continue to increase over time. Um, I did a really amazing tour of South Berkeley, a black history tour of South Berkeley just a couple of weeks ago. And South Berkeley was basically, there was a red line right in Berkeley. And the only place that black and brown households could live was on the South side of that, 
um, that red line and just amazing stories of the vibrancy of that neighborhood. But the woman who was leading that tour, we walked by her household home and she said, my father built that triplex in the backyard to generate the income we needed to be able to stay in that house. And I'm thinking, well, how many neighborhoods in the country could a homeowner even be allowed to build that triplex or a duplex or an ADU in the back to, to, to keep a, a family in a neighborhood? And um, it's, uh, it's just an important part of the conversation and decision-making and uh, that we need to be thinking very, being very thoughtful about. I think there's lots more we could probably talk about with community owned development and, and financed and, and all of that. But the last question has got to be on reflections on Atlanta. You haven't been here in a long time. It has changed quite a lot since you've been here. Any thoughts about the Beltline and its place in supporting missing middle housing? It's kind of being built up pretty more much more densely than yeah, the missing middle and right I don't, now. I don't mind. I mean, there's absolutely a place, a lot of places where bigger buildings make total sense. It's just that we haven't identified and removed the barriers for the middle scale in the way that we have for the big scale, right? Uh, 15 to 20 years ago, when we were starting our practice and even when, you know, when you were practicing, like, cities didn't know how to deliver those, enable those big buildings. And they, they figured it out. They, and they figured out how to remove the barriers to allow the big buildings. And now they need to sharpen their pencils to figure out where and how to deliver the missing middle scale at, at, at the same volume and just prioritize where that should happen um, in, in every part of the city. And I, I do want to emphasize is like, I was pretty blown away by just what I've seen in a day in terms of how hot your market is um and it and the weather and the weather um and to be quite honest it terrifies me a little bit because i've seen other places like this i was in bentonville a couple months ago arkansas that is one of the craziest markets in the in the country um and in particular the small towns are really feeling the pressure but um i do feel like there's still an opportunity here like like our work in sacramento they're they're not yet where the Bay Area of California is, but in six or seven or eight years, if they don't do something now, um, it's going to be too late. And I think there's still an opportunity here in Atlanta, as I mentioned, to try to try to get ahead of that tsunami of development, which, you know, I think it can be a really good thing and um, establish the right planning policy and, and zoning to, to make sure you're not existing residents aren't getting pushed out. And um, uh, I just hope that, you know, if I come, hopefully I come back sooner than five years from now, but if I come back in five years, that there's some really innovative uh, policy planning and zoning in place to, to get ahead of this, uh, the tsunami of real estate development pressures. Well, we certainly hope you come back yeah. sooner than that as well. And I do want to let everyone know. So I had the pleasure of, I got to interview Dan for a podcast uh, this morning. And so that will be posted on the Redesigning Cities website, in addition to wait, really getting some weird sounds here, but <laughs> in addition to the video of tonight, um, I hope you all, I, I want to thank you, Dan. I want to thank again, TSW. And I want to welcome folks to uh, uh, join us at the book signing. And thank you all very much. <laughs>